Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the ECU Medical and Health Sciences Foundation, welcome to tonight's uh, pandemic response webinar. Uh, my name is Herb Garrison. I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and a professor of emergency medicine. But uh, this evening, I'm the interim president of the foundation, and I get to serve as the moderator for this great night. Um, I want to start by thanking Missy Fallon. Uh, she's the gift officer for the foundation for the Brody School of Medicine and envisioned and produced tonight's um, uh, event. And uh, I also want to thank Nicole Stokes for her behind the scenes uh, work. We have a lot of uh, special people with us tonight in the audience, uh, and time precludes me from introducing and welcoming everybody individually, but I do want to especially welcome Dean uh, Sylvia Brown from the College of Nursing and Dean Greg Chadwick from the ECU School of Dental Medicine. Uh, the focus tonight is gonna be on the Brody School of Medicine, faculty from the Brody School of Medicine, but the College of Nursing and the School of Dental Medicine students and faculty have been doing a lot of work in this area as well. So I wanna make sure that gets acknowledged. Um, the mission of the foundation is to support um, with resources, the work of the students and faculty of ECU Health Sciences to help them in their mission to serve Eastern North Carolina and the state of North Carolina. It's fitting uh, that today is the one year anniversary of when the World Health Organization declared us to be in a coronavirus a pandemic. I've uh, had played a minor role in the response, but I've been close enough on the sidelines to, to watch just the incredible work that's taken place uh, on behalf of ECU Health Sciences and, and work that's being done also out of Vidant Medical Center. And the leaders of that have been many, but some of them have been the, on this panel tonight, and in particular, Drs. Bolin and Shackelford and Dr. Stacy. And so I'm gonna get out of the way and let them do the talking. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Stacy, who you all know. Dr. Stacy is the um, Dean of the Brady School of Medicine and the Vice Chancellor uh, for ECU Health Sciences. Um, he comes to us by way of Missouri, and um, I, I, what I like to say about Dr. Stacy is he wrote the book on dystonia and then he got here as fast as he could uh, to help lead us. And so Mark, take it away. Thank you, Herb. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for your commitment to Brody School of Medicine, to ECU and the region, especially during this time of COVID. Uh, this has been an extraordinary year and tonight we'll have a chance to talk about the transformational possibilities that this fight with a virus has provided. Uh, before that, I'd like for you all to know how proud I am of us. Together, we have found ways that, we're, that we'll be reinventing education for graduate public health, um, uh, medical students, and all students in the future, and how they inquire, acquire information for years to come. Uh, in the medical school, we've continued to increase our research funding. And just last week, we received notification of a full eight-year accreditation uh, for the Brody School of Medicine. That means you don't have to worry about accreditation for four years, and then you have to start the drill all over for four years to get ready for 20, uh, 2028. Let me start with some good news. Um, next Monday is Chancellor Philip Rogers' first day at ECU after an eight-year absence. I didn't know him from that time, but without exception, everybody who did has nothing but praise for his ability to listen, his intellect, his character, and his ability to move things forward. In my few meetings with him since he accepted the job, it's clear to me that he's a strategic thinker and he is excited about the opportunity to this time move his vision forward. I am excited about the chance to help him and set this vision for health sciences and be a part of that. Further good news came from the Board of Governors last month. Jennifer Haygood, who is the CFO uh, for the system office reported that state revenues were up 14% from last year and down by seven and expenses were down by 7%. This is much better than was predicted in October. Um, and so the system office submitted a budget for the same amount as uh, the prior uh, budget uh, submission. So we will not be having a budget cut, um, we don't think uh, for uh, next year. And, and I'm also optimistic that we won't have a reversion budget cut or a budget in our current budgets for this year. 
And finally, for the first time, the this Board of Governors included a, a new medical education building for Brody School of Medicine uh, in their four building requests uh, for capital requests and clearly stated to all other chancellors they are not to request any other buildings and go, and go around, uh, around the Board of Governors. So with that, with the fact that we already have bilateral um, bills, uh, for bipartisan bills in both houses, uh, uh, I am pretty excited about the potential for uh, this new building. I mentioned the medical school has curriculum has made major changes to sneak around this pesky virus. Um, and we all went online to start uh, at the start for our first and second year students. It was hard. The faculty had to record their lectures without the benefit of an audience feedback. We did that. And the students now watch them at twice speed. So instead of investing in resources for faculty to speak faster, um, I would like for uh, us to see if we can increase the content that, that we provide and have more face-to-face -face conversations about that content um, uh, in the future. And that will be how we uh, play with ch curriculum changes during these next four years. The students want the face-to-face -face contact uh, and they don't mind listening to the, to the lectures at twice speed, uh, but they want face-to-face -face contact like we all do, to commune, to learn and laugh together. Um, and uh, right now chat, uh, in chat rooms and move to small groups in the future. I hope that we will be in full classrooms by the fall. In the clinical years, we had a three month period where no students were in clinic spaces. That put us at risk for graduation in some students. So to keep track to graduate, we did two things. The first was develop a completely new course on the history of pandemics and public health solutions for those times. A lessons learned history lesson that still applies for today. We also condensed our clinical box from eight to six weeks, an extremely difficult leap for both students and faculty. A six week block is by far from ideal and we, this will not be permanent. But I think this pandemic block is important for our medical students and it's important for our region. We simply cannot afford healthcare. We must get better at public health and keeping people healthy, which is one of the things that, that we're gonna talk about tonight. We also received an opportunity to remind our friends in Raleigh how great ECU and Brody School of Medicine is at keeping promises. Our mission since the very beginning of the school was to increase the supply of primary care physicians to serve North Carolina, to improve the health of the citizens of North Carolina, to enhance the access to minority and disadvantaged students to medical education. So in 2018, we asked the Shep Center at UNC to provide us information about our graduates they told us that of the 1,723 ECU and uh, Biden re uh, residency graduates um, that we have in the state, um, that that is 5% of the entire pop physician population. However, if we look in medically un underserved communities, this is where you find our physicians, and we are 17% of that workforce. In the 1990s, we realized that we, we needed to grow our medical school class, um, and to do that, we needed to grow our clinical faculty. Uh, we didn't call it ECUP that back then, but that essentially was, uh, was a ECUP. This effort has helped to change the, the health in, in our region in every measure you can imagine. But the one I like the best is simply lifespan. How long do you live? It's a measure that no one can debate. And in 1990, the 1 1.7 million people in Eastern North Carolina lived two years less on average than every other region in the state. In 2017, we caught up. You don't have to imagine what 3.4 million years has done for this region. You just need to look around and be grateful that you live in a small city with great amenities. I know that I am, and I'm so pleased to be here. Now, last July, uh, we're getting to the, to the real meat of the, of the evening, but last July we received 15 million in federal COVID relief funds from the state of North Carolina with an expectation to spend it by December 29th, 2020. We did that. And we set about spending it on developing projects that were within our mission. How do we deliver vaccine to people in places that are, gaps, have, are in gaps of medical care? How do we develop adequate testing facilities? How do we use our testing technologies for less invasive testing so we don't have to use nasal swab testing in the future? How do we increase our bench research capacity for um, looking at models of COVID? And how do we better treat our patients with COVID? We've seen an energized faculty from these projects, and I think we'll see more funding from the state and we'll receive grant funding from a variety of funders, both local and federal, um, because of our success. 
These opportunities will allow us to provide equipment for our new medical school building, and I hope we get to set the cornerstone in 2022 to match the 50th anniversary of the first students that were enrolled at Broly School of Medicine. In the future, we'll seek your advice with, about scholarships that help us land students who now go elsewhere for more financial opportunity. Um, we'll also help ask for help in developing strategies to recruit phys physician leaders uh, with recruitment packages that make it attractive to come here. But tonight we're gonna hear for two, from two physicians that are, known, that are well known to many of you. In fact, Dr. Poland will, Dr. Bolin will tell you that everybody knows Dr. Shackelford, a statement that Dr. Shackelford has yet to be able to deny without a smile that betrays his statement to the contrary. They're both from generations of Eastern North Carolina people. They've taken the mission of delivery of care to um, Eastern North Carolina to a new level with resources that are available from our COVID relief funds. Their experiences will be a cornerstone for the new way that we deliver care to people who live in rural communities and not just in North Carolina. So Dr. Bowen and Dr. Shackelford, the, the screen is yours. Dr. Stacy, before uh, you get started, uh, we, we just wanted to remind the audience that if they have any questions, we may be able to ask them towards the end if they would put them in the chat. So Nicole, can you pull my slides up? I apologize to everyone, I can't speak without PowerPoint. I also want to congratulate uh, uh, Missy Fallon for choosing tonight out of all nights in the year to be the anniversary of the pandemic. It's a great move, Missy. And it seems unbelievable that just a year ago, uh, Jay Fallon was building a testing program, one of the most efficient in the state. We were putting together one of the first convalescent plasma programs in the state. We now have gone on to, just in my department, uh, uh, over two dozen uh, clinical trials from NIH to pharma to collaboratives. Probably the most important thing we've done over this past year is educate our region, one of the hallmarks of an academic medical center. We, we filter through the, the changes that have occurred with COVID uh, uh, once a week, we have about 150 providers every week from AHEC, uh, and that's really been a, a, a standard uh, for what we've done during this year. And of course, here in the, the waning days of the pandemic, we, we have turned uh, to administering a vaccine. So it's been quite a remarkable uh, year. Next slide. I wanna to tonight talk to you about an opportunity to turn the tragedy of COVID into a long-term gain for Eastern North Carolina. Now, early in the course of COVID, the map that you see in front of you is part of a larger map of the United States that demonstrates the excessive penetrance of risk factors for severe COVID in the Southeastern United States and the Mississippi Valley. For obvious reasons, I've chosen to only show you North Carolina. But what you see, and it may be cut off because of the box on the right, but as you move from the white boxes through the gray and blue boxes to the black boxes, you actually see that the penetrance of these risk factors for severe COVID are as low as 22% in the triangle and as high as 66% in Eastern North Carolina. And I think it's remarkable the comments of Dr. Stacy regarding the impact the Brody School and others have had on improving mortality in Eastern North Carolina. And we have done that with the presence of these risk factors. Not surprisingly, those risk factors are the same leading causes of the mortality that Dr. Stacy mentioned earlier. We know that one of the leading causes of this mortality is when these diseases present late. Instead of presenting with early kidney damage, they present with end-stage renal failure. They present with stage four cancer instead of stage one. And we know the problem is, is that people are not seeking care early enough. Another interesting thing that occurred early in COVID is I began and others as well were inundated with calls and emails. How can I protect my family member? What can I do right now that can keep me from getting severe COVID. And I'm sure many of you, like I did, daily took your dose of vitamin D in hopes that those type things could help us. We have identified 
many of these risk factors demonstrated in the darker counties here as things that we want to, uh, to go after in this project and screen for and create early interventions. Next slide. So we did a survey, over a thousand uh, individuals east of I-95 of when's the last time you went to see a doctor and if it's been more than five years, why? And this is a list of many of the things that popped up. We were somewhat surprised that number one was that care is too complex and too inconvenient. Now it was followed closely by number two, which was is, is too expensive. So about that time, Dr. Shackelford joined my department and we started coming up with a plan on, okay, how can we get at this? And we've created a series of screenings, we call them, where we go to places of work uh, and we screen individuals for these risk factors for COVID, for severe COVID and for increased mortality in Eastern North Carolina. We check their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their hemoglobin A1C, their creatinine, and then at the end, we sit down and we counsel them about it for a brief moment. And so the main feature of this program that we've addressed is the cost of it. We have kept cost of this to an absolute razor minimum. One of the concerns was limited transportation and getting to the doctor. That's not an issue. We go, we go to them. We meet them at work. We've been to garages, paint shops, factories, uh, fishing wharfs. Uh, we've been to about a dozen of these in, in the past four months. Care being too complex, we keep our visits to 10 minutes. Now we have a counseling session at the end that may run a little bit longer, but we try to just keep it as simple as possible. In addition, we send out on a somewhere between a month and two month basis, health reminders to the individuals that we screen just to give them one point that they can do to improve their health. The last one that went out is please go get your COVID shot. Imagine the timeliness of that. Concerns about privacy. We actually let the people that participate this complete the screening before we ask them to be a part of our research project. We actually take all their data, we collate it onto an iPad and show them the results and counsel them and tell them that we would like to follow up with this to see how your attitudes about healthcare change over time and how we can help you with that. And only at that point do we take identifying information regarding that individual for follow-up. Again, another complaint was there's no time. I'm working two and a half jobs. Well, again, we meet you at work. So it's, it's amazing what that has done. Fear. I think the most impressive thing that has happened during this so far is to see the effect of meeting people at work among their peers and how that decreases their fear of going to the doctor. If we have time tonight, I'll tell you a marvelous story about a garage in Winterval. Uh, but I won't take time for that right now. So uh, next slide, please. So we've created all these opportunities in Eastern North Carolina, and I'm going to get Dr. Shackelford to tell you about a few of them. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we, uh, um, this is a, a great shot of a, a physician named Bob Shaw, who's doing his work in one of our immunization clinics. I mean, we we have two things we're pushing for right now. The most important thing in Eastern North Carolina at the moment is getting COVID vaccinations completed. And this is a, an event we did with the Aiden uh, Housing Authority last week. And we just are very appreciative of the opportunity to work with not only Aiden, but anybody who's willing to help us with that. Um, through uh, the work that we've done, including the health screening and the vaccination stuff, we've touched about 500 lives in aggregate as of today with some work that we completed in Winterville as, as well. So. Next slide. This is sort of where we're headed for the future. I mean, this is a, one of the, uh, the things that the, we were able to do is not only get the van that you see in the background that will pull that trailer, but that's a trailer that's got two clinic rooms in it. So if we don't have a facility we can work in, we'll bring one to you. I mean, so we should be able for the short term to be able to continue our immunization work, not only in Pitt County, but all over Eastern North Carolina. 
as well as uh, uh, provide continue this health screening work that Dr. Bowen outlined in, 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 in any areas. It, it's somewhat related to an occupational health idea, but the reality of it is that we're working with community, with uh, businesses that probably don't have occupational health backgrounds or uh, the ability to even put those kind of programs in place. So uh, uh, we want to survey Eastern North Carolina and, and continue to A, discover people who need our help, B, reassure those who don't need our help, and then C, learn how to better serve our entire community through this effort. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll defer back to Dr. Uh, Stacy. It's a good looking trailer. Uh, I appreciate um, you all uh, coming on and uh, being willing to uh, answer some questions, but uh, uh, since I get to ask the first question, Paul, tell us the story you uh, didn't tell us. So we were in a garage in um, Winterville, and um, as uh, Dr. Shackelford said, most of these places we've gone are very small shops, and um, there was a bunch of guys in there, and if I can be sexist, guys are not too interested in their health care. And there was about a dozen of them, and they ranged from age 20 to 60-something. And we were doing the screenings, and, and I got into one of the most erudite conversations regarding diabetes I think I've ever been in, and, and questions that were so probing, uh, and, and the thought that, wow, your A1C can be too low. And it deteriorated in a great way into a contest between the guys who worked there of who had the lowest A1C. And, and I just sit there thinking, I have never seen a group of people as engaged in their healthcare as I have right now. And we've seen this over and over again uh, in every one of our screenings, the interest that people seem to bond with their fellow workers uh, in, in doing this. And so I think this idea that uh, we go and meet people at work uh, has really been a key, key uh, help to this. And so that's, that's one of the things that I think we, we've already learned from this, but uh, I'll throw one to uh, Dr. Shackelford. Uh, what are you learning from the pandemic that, that we need to incorporate when working uh, in uh, these rural under, underserved populations in the future? Well, I, I think the pandemic gives us an opportunity, as Paul said, that to have conversations, minds are open. I forget the, who, who the quote was, but never waste a crisis. I mean, we, we have a lot of folks that are interested in healthcare now that I think the most intriguing conversations we have, not only the ones when we do screening who have issues and problems, of course, we want to get them into local healthcare and ECU, of course, if they don't have local healthcare, but it's the great conversations we get to have with people who you can't really, you're probably doing okay and, and want to have a discussion about their health care over, overall. So I think the pandemic has given us that opportunity to begin to, to uh, engage people in, in the next phase of, of how we improve mortality. I, I think my line is, is biscuit poisoning. Eastern North Carolina loves a good biscuit. Bojangles is a great place, but too much of a good thing can be a problem. So as long as we can have discussions about how to moderate those type of things, improve exercise, you know, standard, standard answers that we give that, that, that would be given, but their minds are open in a way that we're answering their questions about those things as opposed to preaching to them in a way that their minds might be closed. So it's, it's, it's been very humbling and uh, opportunity. I love the, the, the public health to care uh, approach that this, um, this, uh, of this model, you give them a public health a vaccine shot that they want, and then you talk to them about their health from a public health standpoint, and then you follow up to say, now let's really talk about your health. Uh, tell me, uh, are people following up with you and are they trying to get further care? I, I, I know Dr. Bolin has a, a story about uh, a person with uh, really bad hypertension. Um, and, and how did that, uh, how did that, sto how did that story uh, start and end or where is it now? So we were in a, a factory in Kinston, North Carolina, and the, the uh, health nurse there told me that it's an average occurrence for once a week for somebody to fall out in the factory and require an ambulance. And I didn't believe her before the screening. And um, this lady who was really the picture of health came in and had a blood pressure that astonished even me. And I think, Paul, I think we took it about seven times before, before we finally believed it. And um, 
So I saw her in clinic uh, here the next day. And, and by the way, these people are insured. They have health insurance. Them, them not going to the doctor has nothing to do with, well, less to do with, with cost. And, and, um, and so I saw her that uh, uh, next day and getting back to the question you asked Dr. Shackelford, you know, these people, they can get spooked pretty quick. And so I bit my nails and I didn't put her in the hospital. She still had a diastolic of 118, but it was down from a diastolic of 144. And, and we've upped her meds and uh, actually we have a scheduled phone call tomorrow. So we will put her in, in into uh, our system. She was dissatisfied with her present uh, state of care where she had stopped her medications. And Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've seen about a half dozen people who were literally a couple of days away from a major health event. We, we saw a lady in Newburn who, again, picture of health, walked in and had a hemoglobin A1C of 9.8. And yeah, you know, her follow-up so, uh, uh, random blue uh, type to the health nurse was 375. Right. So we, we, uh, we get follow-up. Sometimes it's in the community, as Paul just mentioned, and sometimes we see them because they want to come there. Uh, but we've had some dramatic numbers of people that look really good and are going to work. And so I, I do think we have the possibility with this platform to start intervening in earlier stages of disease. And I think that's going back to your early comments, Dr. Stacy. that's what's going to take us where our mortality is lower than the rest of the state. I agree. So we have our first uh, volunteer. So Doug Barrow has uh, wants to join your team. So uh, I'll uh, let you reach out to him. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and Tom Robinson. Uh, Tom Robinson has asked. Um, I've been reading about vaccine distribution being disproportionately show, slower in rural areas. How can we help? Let me. This is your me, chance. Yeah. I mean, so we were in in Winterville today. We were in Aiden yesterday. Uh, we have a discussion with uh, DHHS about working with uh, the farm workers at the end of the week. I mean, we, we, uh, we're taking that mission at the heart. Now, the one thing to tell you about vaccine delivery when you, when you do this is it ain't, it's not a lot of volume. I mean, so the mass vaccination sites have done an absolutely fabulous job of, of handling volume, whether that's the Vidant site. I think the line I use is they're better than Chick-fil-A. You know, it's been great. Um, the, the Wilmington site at the movie theater was another great, great, great approach to things. We eke them out 50 and 100 at a time. I mean, we were, uh, we were at a church in Winterville today and we did 100 immunizations, but, it, but we, were, we were eking them out. And these are individuals that for various reasons are either unwilling or unable to get to the mass vaccination sites. So um, we were fortunate to partner with a church in Winterville. Uh, the, the leadership in that church and, of course, the political leadership in the town of Winterville were very supportive of this. And we lived out on the street there sometimes with cars running by recruiting people to come in for their vaccine. But uh, uh, the ECU physicians and, and uh, nurses, medical students, and, and not medical students, excuse me, we had a public health student with us today, which is really awesome, uh, uh, really have stepped up with regard to, you know, serving the community wanting to learn how to do things, learn new knowledge, which is the things that we really gain out of this is how to deliver better care. The issues that we discover in the vaccine clinics are very similar to the issues we discover in the health screening clinics. I mean, it's about the disparities and, and, and trying to get the, the, uh, the service to the patient uh, as best we can. It doesn't mean that the, the other sites aren't doing a really good job. I really, really want to want to make sure folks understand that those mass vac sites are doing a great service, but well, that's not who we're targeting. We're targeting people who either not going there or can't get there. And that, that's that been very rewarding. So one of the stories I like is that group home story where you where you didn't really know where you're going is out in the middle of nowhere. So describe that. Yeah, we uh, we had a great group home story. We uh, we show up. Uh, number one, the sales, cell phones quit working. I think uh, we had AT&T, Verizon, and U.S. Cell, and none of the sales worked. I mean, so the cell phone quit working in Pitt County. Um, the most recent time when we came to give a follow up, it was raining. And so the house only lets two or three people in at a time. And so you have to stand outside to, to you know, all the sort of things that, uh, involved with mobile activity. But, but it was, it was, they needed the vaccine. They wanted that vaccine. And, and so, you know, they were as kind and accommodating as, as a group of individuals we could be. 
Our follow-up though was another house where I think my favorite story is giving vaccines across the kitchen table uh, where we can see the hot sauce and the salt and pepper, you know, those kind of things. So we've done all kinds of things uh, to make sure that those individuals, and, but you have to be flexible. You have to be, understand that it's not efficient. I mean, we, we're not delivering volume when we do that. But from a medical perspective, these are the individuals probably the most vulnerable and it's also the way that we make sure that this virus doesn't stay nested in our, in our community in, in some small fashion. So one of the things that I have um, marveled at since arriving here is how good we are at taking care of each other during a hurricane. How does this different, differ from that hurricane drill? Um, I have the privilege of not only uh, doing a bunch of hurricanes when I was with a, a, a Vida Medical Center, but also I've had the privilege of deploying with the state medical assist team most recently on Ocracoke with that, that, uh, that uh, component. This is very different. This is a sustained long-term effort. Uh, Ocracoke was a long time. I mean, we were out there for several weeks. I mean, again, that particular team did an awesome job. I, I have nothing but compliments for it. But we, have to, we are now hunting for people that need vaccines and we are going to them uh, which is, which is you know, again, somewhat divergent from how we respond to the hurricanes. It's very similar in concept, but it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So, um, I, Doug Barrow uh, has also um, responded that, uh, um, that she has, he has contact with a North Carolina minister that uh, uh, wants to Im immunize people exactly the way you're doing it. How can he help coordinate? So. Um, if we'll collect all these questions and send them to you and uh, um, that way uh, we can make sure we help as many people as, as possible. That's what the point of this is tonight. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're happy to help. Uh, we coordinate with Pitt County Health Department. I can't tell you how much of value John Silvernail is, not only personally, but professionally with regard to this. He has helped us direct our traffic to make sure we're going to the correct locations, make sure that we're distributing things appropriately. We always engage him. He's been a good resource, not only for Pitt County, but for the region as well. So, you know, we look forward to continuing to work with him. But if, if folks have a place they want to go, if I can get vaccine, we're going to go. And, and so tell them how you get vaccine. Right now, we are, are working in a program that the state provides for historically uh, marginalized communities. So we're, it's, a, it's a specific program that this state provides. Um, so we're able to accomplish that goal through the locations that we choose. So again, last week we went to the uh, Aiden Housing Authority, had a wonderful experience there. I mean, just, just were, I mean, I can't tell you how welcoming the community was there. Today we did a similar event in Winterville, again, working with a, with a church there. Next week we're working with another church run by a, a, a lady named Eve Rogers, who's a uh, uh, the church is called New Dimensions, and it's we're going to target the West Greenville community, and and possibly the, I think we're working with the Greenville Housing Authority as well. Those details have not been ironed out, but but at their their request and Dr. Silvernail's direction, he's he's really helping us make sure that we distribute this vaccine in an equitable manner. Thanks. So Diane Poole uh, asked a question: How does Brody use these great works? Uh, to not only enhance uh, our presence and influence, but also collaborate with public health departments to increase their state funding so they can more effectively do the important job they were created to do. Well, uh, we're trying to figure that out. Um, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, we've become less, um, uh, we've, uh, I don't really like hiding our light under a bushel. So we've become really bad at hiding our light under a bushel since I've been here. But, but Dr. Shackford, you have, uh, you have the response for that one. Tell us, Tell us what you're thinking. Well, number one, we, we have to have collaboration with our partners. So, you know, most recently we, we've had some reach out recently from our partners at Biden Health who want to work with us and, and collaborate in the region, which is just awesome. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to welcome anybody that wants to do the work. Um, we have had some uh, conversation with DHHS through the former Pitt County uh, director named John Morrow, who is helping us look at other counties outside of Pitt County potentially how we're able, able to do this. A, again, we have a, a phone call later this week, again, through DHHS to work with uh, um, the agricultural workers that are coming to the state. I had a privilege of talking with a, a local farmer uh, on Tuesday and he reminded me we were gonna have 700 to 1,000 new residents in Pitt County here real fast under the H2A program and that, that 
it was to our mutual benefit to make sure they were vaccinated. So, I mean, one, the intel from him was beautiful about when and how to do that, but it also uh, gives us, you know, hope with regard to where we, we need to go to make sure not only we're looking after folks, but they'll be vaccinated for when they return back home as well. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to that opportunity. Dr. Bowen, you mentioned earlier uh, about your weekly uh, COVID uh, program that people all over the state tune into. How else do you, are people reaching out to you? Or are you uh, helping in the state? I think my uh, cell phone has been posted in every bathroom in North Carolina since it started. Um, it's usually by cell phone. Um, and of course, we've advertised uh, before we had the hotline uh, for either convalescent plasma or antibodies in any kind of the trials that we had. Uh, we really had to put, put the, the numbers out there because there was no way that individuals had to call in and reach. You know, one of the great lessons we've learned from this is uh, it's really nice to tell everybody to shelter at home. But you gotta you gotta explain that a little better. I, I think uh, we we that ended up being a problem because we a lot of people couldn't connect with the healthcare system. To get back to Diane's question, I hope I'm getting at this. We have also collaborated with a number of FQHCs in Eastern North Carolina, and one of the things we've done not only there but also in in a couple of the industries that we've met with is we're attempting to set up some nodes for telemedicine. So once again, these individuals that have trouble connecting with healthcare don't have to go to the doctor. The doctor will come to them virtually. And so we're, we're going to pilot that, we hope, in one of the factories uh, local to us uh, pretty soon. So one question uh, that, uh, that I get is, will we ever have another pandemic? Is this the last one? Dr. Bolin, uh, that would be in your area of expertise. And I know the simple answer is probably not. The last pandemic, but why don't you give the real answer? Right, we're, we'll we'll have them, and we will have them, and we are having them more frequently as history proceeds. And and if you go through the cousins of the COVID virus, uh, the ones that just barely sideswiped us a few years ago, uh, we were very fortunate with. And and so, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen with COVID. Is it going to become a seasonal pathogen? Uh, I think anybody that uh, thinks that COVID's not going to be around for at least another three years, uh, th th that is absolutely not true. We're going to have the presence of it for the short term, uh, absolutely. And there will be others. And, and I think both scientifically, clinically, and public health-wise, we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons in 1918 that we somehow ignored. And, and so we not only need to learn those lessons, we need to carry them forward so that the generations can, can learn from them. We, early on in, in the convalescent plasma program, um, I kept pushing for us to do that because the answer that we needed to gain for future pandemics. We will not have monoclonal antibodies until we can prove something works. And, and the, the only way I know to do that right now is with something similar to convalescent plasma. So uh, I hope we'll store these away in a much better form than we did before uh, and that we can use this information uh, better next time. And talk a little bit about how the virus um, gets new, how we get new variants and, and what does that mean? So um, I think, um, gosh, I wish Bobby were on the line. I don't know if our COVID update is, uh, uh, recorded today on the AHEC website. If it is, a more extensive answer of that will be there. Uh, but we have several variants that we're monitoring. Uh, the ones that are probably closest to mind is, is the UK variant that's now pretty active in Eastern Europe. Uh, we have some cases uh, uh, locally. Uh, Jay Fallon's done a marvelous job of now being able to test for these variants in our lab here uh, uh, in Greenville. And, and so, uh, we're going to be impacted by those. We presented data today uh, that uh, T-cell studies demonstrate that uh, despite these variants, that both the vaccines and those that have had uh, COVID and have, if you will, convalescent plasma, have similar T-cell responses. I think sometimes in the literature, we get a little too focused on antibodies and how fast antibodies go away. 
Well, anytime you have a, a bee sting and that allergic reaction, well, you want all that mechanism to eventually go away. There will be memory cells of it, but you want the inflammatory part to go away. So I don't make as big an issue about uh, antibodies as you hear in the news. Uh, we, we feel pretty comfortable that, that we're gonna have a good response to those. I, I think in the next month, we, we will know what uh, where the Y-intercept is gonna occur, if you will, and that is uh, when vaccinations catch up with mutations. And if, if we can get to that point, uh, I'm predicting that sometime right around the tax day, that at least we'll be able to take a good deep breath for the first time. Dr. Shackelford, uh, there are three different types of vaccines that we have right now. Um, one of them is that J&J &J vaccine that uh, you only have to use once. Uh, to me, that makes um, your job uh, twice as easy because you don't have to go back and visit. Uh, do you have concerns about the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine? Absolutely not. I mean, we, we feel like, one, we're capable with uh, our physical uh, ability to take care of take Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J into the field. So we're, we're at the point, we're at the mercy of our supply chain. So we're going to take whatever we receive. Um, the J&J &J vaccine is, is, is a little bit more stable thermally. So it's a little bit easier to transport and maintain. And uh, obviously it's a single dose vaccine. Now there are, as, as we're aware, discussions about potential booster doses for J&J &J related to these variants, but at this point it's still considered a single dose. So, uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity when we get some J&J. &J. Uh, all, all of the uh, sites that we do currently, we schedule four weeks to follow up because we're, we're privileged to have the Moderna vaccine currently. But uh, um, as, as if I have a preference, I'm gonna to try to get some J&J &J vaccine. Yeah. And um, do you think being vaccinated with all three of them is better than just one. Is there any advantage to getting vaccines from, from uh, in any of those? Where are we gonna hear that conversation? You know, it's interesting. I, I was in uh, a, a discussion with a young lady about a week ago who decided that she wanted the Pfizer vaccine, not Moderna vaccine. This was actually in Aden. And we had a nice 30 minute conversation about various, you know, various things. And she had all her internet research ready to go. and. At the end of the day, you know, I told her that I thought the best vaccine was the one you could get. And uh, she, she politely disagreed and left. So uh, um, I think the efficacy numbers with regard to, to certain parameters are, are maybe a little lower with the J&J &J vaccine. But if you look at the big issues with regard to hospitalization and, one, and, and, and mortality, it performs quite well. And again, these studies were done at different times and different populations. So it's really... I don't think it's fair to compare their efficacy directly because we've never done a head-to-head -head comparison of these vaccines. So. My question was, should you get, so I've had the Pfizer, should I go get a J&J &J just to be that much more immune? <laughs> no. no, I don't think so. I think one's good. <laughs> I was trying to lobby a softball there. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm not smart enough to catch that. Please forgive me. <laughs> So we have a, about uh, four or five minutes, and I'd like to give uh, each of you a, a chance to, to talk about what we didn't talk about or um, anything that you um, really uh, need help with. Um, but uh, Dr. Shackford, go ahead. I think the biggest thing we want help with is that we would like people to let us know where we can do health screening. We would appreciate the opportunity to come to small businesses, large businesses, um, and, and, and continue the, the, the work that we feel like will help us in the future for Eastern North Carolina. We have plenty of targets for vaccine. Of course, we're always welcome to take more targets for vaccinations, but that's gonna burn itself out, I think in the next six to eight weeks, or at least gonna get to a maintenance level. Uh, what we think the long-term benefit of this is, is if we've got a painting company, a commercial fishing process, or a chicken process, or a boat manufacturer, if we've got any of those, those, and candidly, they're usually the size that cannot or will not have an occupational health program. So we're not, we're not trying to reproduce that product and, and do those type of things necessarily, but we feel like with, that, that most employees in North Carolina, most workers in North Carolina are in small businesses of 50 employees or less. We'd love the opportunity to come do some health screening with, with folks. Dr. Bowen? I, I think the greatest opportunity uh, locally that this that we've not discussed is um, the impact for collaboration within the school. Um, we had planned to rebuild, we had an honors course uh, 
over on East Campus years ago from my department. And um, uh, we were going to start that in the spring. And some kids over there in Honors College found out what we were doing. And next thing you know, we got a bunch of undergrads running around with us and, and helping out. And we've really interdigitated with a lot of potential uh, opportunities. Uh, Shaq had mentioned earlier this uh, working with medics uh, that, that are coming out of the military. Uh, uh, there, there's just a ton of opportunities to use this as a platform for public health uh, and transforming our, our, our region. I, um, I, I, and the other thing I think that needs to be studied, and, and we have an indirect way to do this through, through our project, is what is this going to do to the economy, uh, to help the economy of Eastern North Carolina? Uh, we are focally going after folks at work. And, and that is our focus. And, and you can't have a healthy economy if you don't have a healthy workforce. That's just an absolute necessity. Thanks. So Michelle Brooks has asked, after the pandemic and vaccine rollout, what will the vans and equipment be used for going forward? And, and my easy answer is anything and everything that anybody at, at ECU wants to use them for. But Paul, you give the better answer. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's for sure the answer. But we're going to continue these screenings. Um, I... Um, Dr. Shackelford and I have designed a, a three-year flight path. Uh, it's going to take us, you know, we've only been at this for four months. Uh, uh, and, and so we're barely getting off the ground with this thing. And, and uh, it, it's uh, every week it gets more interesting. And I hope that keeps happening um, uh, because I, I do think there's a lot of people we can touch. We've barely scratched the surface. Uh, there's a lot of doors that were not necessarily open early on that are now open. Uh, I, I, uh, so yeah, we, we're going to keep doing our thing and anybody that wants to use it, uh, that's fine. We do uh, uh, want to make sure people know how to drive a trailer. Dr. Shackelford and I grew up on a farm, so we're, we're qualified, but uh, we don't want to, we're going to be careful about who drives the trailer because it's pretty big. Yeah, we, we want to make sure that all the health services division have an opportunity to participate. I mean, we, we've had really good interactions with our dental colleagues. I mean, some of our original work was working with the Dental Service Learning Center sites. Uh, Rob Temple in particular has been just an awesome colleague associated with this. We've had good luck. I, I can't call names from the nursing school, but we've had great interfaces with the nursing school as well. So we feel like this is an opportunity for all of health sciences, not just not just, you know, it starts with the with School of Medicine because that's where we live, but this is bigger than, than the School of Medicine. And we've been privileged to work with uh, uh, Keith Wheeler, Open Economic Development on the main campus. And, and again, the undergraduates in the Honors College. So this is all about ECU as a whole, not, not one of its parts. Thank you both for this, this evening. I've enjoyed the conversation. I, I'll leave everybody uh, with a uh, comment before I turn it over to Herb Garrison. And it's, it's my sense that we are great partners um, in the uh, Vident ECU Brody School of Medicine ecosystem. Vident has really primary responsibility for being the health safety net. You get really bad sick and you can get in, to, you go to Vident and they take care of you and, and get you out of the hospital. It's our increasing responsibility in, in ECU to become the public health safety net. We cannot afford hospital care um, when we have stage four or in stage disease. And so this public health effort is gonna really change the way we're able to provide care and maybe uh, provide less care, but more efficiently um, in the future. So uh, Dr. Boland, Dr. Shackford, thank you for your time tonight. Um, Dr. Garrison, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. And Thank you, Paul and Paul. Thank you, Dr. Shackelford and Dr. Boland. And I'm gonna take the moderator's uh, prerogative and ask one final question. Um, I think of this as a combination of old fashioned public health and old fashioned doctrine where you're going directly to the patient where they are. You, you're providing them access on the scene, if you will. It's audacious, it's creative, it's audacious and creative at the same time. And, and here's my question. Uh, it's actually three questions. One, how did you do it so fast? Uh, two, what was the role of COVID as a catalyst? And three, uh, how did you get permission or, or license to do this in, in, given the typical restraints we all face in the bureaucracies we work in? Well, let me well, I'm gonna take that one, Paul. All right, you go ahead. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to talk bad about you. 
Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was an audacious idea. And um, I, I told Shaq that uh, we had to do two or three screenings before we told anybody what we were doing because we could fall flat on our face. So you're exactly right. There was a fear factor there. I think the, the greatest thing that, that happened to make it happen was uh, for Dr. Shackelford to join our department because he, uh, he doesn't mind co coloring outside the lines uh, like I do from time to time. And so to answer your question, we asked no one except the Dean and I'll come back to that in a moment. Absolutely. We, we, we had to, uh, uh, we were fortunate to have startup funds. The CARES Act helped a great deal. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, it was great that we had a crisis, you know, the burning platform. And this thing we've talked about many times tonight that suddenly individuals are interested in their health care. So, so that was great. And then the, the part that surprised me was the breadth of the team that we put together. Uh, boy, uh, I, I think of Ashley, Paul, you know, people in psychology are statisticians, uh, the school of nursing, we, we've dentistry, that we've, it's just been a, it's a very broad root base on, on this project. And I don't think, um, uh, and, and not to embarrass you, uh, Dean Stacy, but uh, I'll be honest with you, great leadership above us was critical. Uh, it, it, Pete and, and, and Dr. Stacy, both Dr. Uh, Schmidt and Dr. Stacy, they, they, they didn't micromanage this. They, I think how you worded this to me, Mark, was uh, what do you need? And then when I told you, you told me to go make it a thing. I think that's exactly how you said it to me. So uh, I think if any one part of this had been missing, I'm not sure we'd be having this conversation right now. Uh, it, it, and it's still not there, Herb. I mean, I, as I said, uh, Paul and I have etched out a three-year plan. Uh, uh, and I think if by year three, uh, where our growth is, is, is flattening and but at a good, we, we have a goal of touching a, a thousand lives a year. We, we've already passed the, the lower limits of that. You know, we're at the rate we're at now, we're at 1200 per, um, we're at 1200 per year right now, uh, if, if you annualize it. So, uh, I think we're, um, uh, uh, I think we're very fortunate to to have the collection of people that we have working on this. That's that's the key piece. It's a true pirate spirit. Let me tell you, it's a bit. Well, thank you all uh, so much. I'm going to wrap us up, and and I want to say uh, again, thank you, thank you to Missy Fallon for putting this together, and Nicole Stokes for helping us with the tech behind the scenes. And I um, also want to put a pitch in for our Pandemic Response and Research Fund. Um, we, we've gotten some help with some federal funds, but those funds have been used and uh, people want to support this. And we know they want to support it uh, with a, a personal volunteer, as Dr. Barrow has already stepped up, but also they may want to support it financially. And that's why we established uh, that fund. So Missy Fallon is going to be in touch with those on the line. Uh, but if you want to reach out to us even before she gets in touch with you, uh, feel free. Uh, and then if specifically it's the Pandemic Response and Research uh, Fund. So um, not seeing any more questions. I think uh, we'll give people a few minutes of their time back and, and wrap it up.